At the end of the century, a new group of suffragists emerged. Tonight, our club meets to talk about winning the vote. Back in the 1850s, the great Sojourner Truth went from town to town, lecturing about suffrage. If the first woman God ever made was able to turn the whole world upside down, she said, then all these women together ought to be able to get it right side up again. Among African American club women, there was little opposition to women voting. The ballot was a crucial weapon in their fight for equality. They were an elite group, educated and middle class, working to help all black people find safety and opportunity in a racist society. Black women need the vote more than white women because they feel by the, the end of the century that if they don't get some political clout, they'll be continually discriminated against. For black women, it's a question of life and death. Most African Americans still lived in the South. Here, all but a few men had been robbed of the vote by poll taxes, literacy tests, and intimidation. Most black families lived in poverty and fear. Over a period of 30 years, 10,000 Negroes had been murdered. How can anyone who is able to use reason withhold from one half the human race rights and privileges freely accorded to the other half? Mary Church Terrell was the outspoken leader of the African-American club movement. Raised in Memphis, the daughter of a successful businessman, Terrell had gone north to Oberlin College and on to a career as an educator and reformer. Widely admired as a suffragist, Terrell was one of the few black women Susan B. Anthony invited to speak at national conventions. Terrell urged white suffragists not to forget black women. Not only are colored women handicapped on account of their sex, they are everywhere mocked on account of their race. We are asking that our sisters of the dominant race do all in their power to include in their resolutions the injustices to which colored people are victims. Terrell's pleas found little support. At that time, suffrage leaders were actively wooing Southern white members. To appease the Southerners, white suffragists found it expedient to abandon their black sisters. So there is much resistance to black women being part of the movement but a determination from black women saying, I don't care, we're going to vote, we're going to be part of this movement. Let us hold our banner high, for we're marching all the while, and we'll win the world for good. Lifting as we climb is the national command to educate and graduate all of Mary Church Terrell was one of a number of black suffrage leaders. With active support from African American men, they built a movement that would grow to half a million. But they would never find acceptance among mainstream suffragists. By the 1890s, women in the Northeast had won some of the rights Elizabeth Stanton had called for at Seneca Falls. Rights to their property, rights to their earnings, rights to their children. Girls could now attend high school, even college, and thousands were going out to work. 
Despite these changes, opposition to suffrage was as stubborn as ever. The duties and life of men and women are divinely ordered to be different. Family is a woman's business. What a In Boston, the most vocal opponents of suffrage were the society women of Beacon Hill. Nothing but degradation can come from placing women in the voting places. They organized the Massachusetts Association opposed to suffrage for women. For them, it was important to show that their capacity to shape the world rested on a particular identity as women that was focused on the home and that drew its sense of moral purity from those domestic roles. They saw the public world of politics as corrupt and male. So if women voted, essentially what they were doing was joining that corrupt male world and they would lose their power to influence. In 1895, the Massachusetts legislature brought the issue of women's suffrage to a head. The state called for both men and women to vote in a non-binding referendum, an opinion poll. Suffrage leader Alice Stone Blackwell had absolute conviction that most women wanted the vote. After next November, suffragists will have a right to speak for a majority of women, unless they are snowed under by the antis, which seems very improbable. Blackwell had grown up in the suffrage movement, the daughter of pioneer Lucy Stone. With her mother, she had built a network of women across the state. Now, she alerted her followers to the coming referendum and went off to Maine for the summer. It would be a fatal error. The suffragists didn't really, I think, take seriously the need to organize. Anti-suffragists had a very strong organization. They plastered Boston with leaflets. The other tactic that the anti-suffragists took was to urge women not to vote at all because they thought this would send a message even stronger than a no vote, that if women simply did not turn out, this would signify how repulsive they found woman suffrage to be. On election day, only a very small percentage of women turned out. In 44 towns in Massachusetts, not a single woman cast a ballot, and woman's suffrage was overwhelmingly defeated. For anti-suffrage women, the referendum was a moral victory that sparked a movement. Soon, they would be a well-financed national organization. It is too bad, said Elizabeth Stanton, that these women are begging to be left in their chains. Thank you.